All right, here, I'll do this. We'll, we'll make it so that I'm, yeah, hey, how you doing, guys? Um, this is, there's a lot of you in here. This is fantastic. Thank you all for coming. So um, if you can't tell from the, uh, from the Calse, uh terminal window up there, um, this is uh, the DevOps panel. Um, we uh, have with us uh, representatives from Chef and Puppet and DevStack. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they are using DevStack. Well, they yeah. are using DevStack. Um, my applications. So we, we were supposed to have also uh, Juju represented, but um, I, I think it's gotten too much traction, and so they're all off running off doing amazing things. Um, so unfortunately, won't be able to hear that story. Um, so I'm Monty, and you have the um, uh, benefit of uh, having me moderate this thing. So uh, any complaints you can... Um, direct them my way afterwards. Uh, you can do that in the form of buying me beers. Uh, it's the best way to complain uh, about any misuse of this forum that I might uh, So do. you just buy the beer that you don't like, or? No, just buy, buying me beer is, I hate it. Okay. So that's the best way to get back at me for doing a bad job here. Um, all right, anyway. <laughs> This is, this is, this well, is going well. Well, hopefully we uh, actually don't have that occur. No, no. I hope no, you get I'm, no beer. Hopefully I get no beer from anybody. Okay. Because it's going to be lovely. You actually down there, Dan, seem like you're not as much in the light as the other two guys. That means I am coming, actually loving it. <laughs> you can right. see people. Um, DevOps. Stand up. Comedy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, oh, and then now, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, anyway, so, <laughs> yes. Um, that having been said, why don't we start with you, Dan, on a quick introduce yourself and your project, why don't you? Tell me what you do. Sure, so my name is, is Dan Bodie, and I'm actually a long time employee of, of Puppet Labs. I actually started when it was just a few guys in a closet. Wait, you were all in the same closet? <laughs> wow. We actually had two closets. We had two closets that we worked out of. His and hers. And then, <laughs> exactly. And then it slowly expanded out into the hall, and then we had to get a proper office, and it's been it's been quite a ride, but we do um, automate, we write automation software called Puppet, so we're the company behind the open source project Puppet, um, and yes, Excellent. and I do stuff. And I do integration work for the business development part, department. So I, I write a lot of code, but I'm, I really report to marketing, so it's kind of a strange job. That is, that is very <laughs> weird. Yeah, Excellent. Uh, what just, because uh, for out of curiosity, what, what city are you guys based out of? We are based out of the, the fantastic city of, of Portland, Oregon. Excellent. Excellent. All right, same question right down the row. So uh, my name is Matt Ray. I'm a, a senior technical evangelist with OpsCode. Um, we are the company behind Chef. Uh, and, you know, as long as we're talking about fantastic cities, I'm from Austin, Texas. <laughs> Love I'm not. Me. I'm not getting trolled for Seattle. Ah, see, I was. I was. Uh, I was going. We're going to have Chef versus Puppet. We yes. should also have Seattle versus Portland. Opscode is based out of Seattle. I'm yeah. actually from Austin, Texas, as well. See, that's really kind of. We went to the same together. university, didn't we? UT Austin. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So. <laughs> Great. You guys did really, really well in football recently. I hear. <clears throat> uh, next topic. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I, I did not expect to get trolled on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, boomer, yeah. boomer something, I think, is the appropriate thing to say. I don't remember. So, uh, yeah, uh, we're the company behind uh, Chef, and uh, most of my time is spent working on a project called uh, Chef for OpenStack, and, you know, I get, just had a session on that about two hours ago. If you missed it, it was great. And uh, I'll post my slides later. Uh, it's just a community project around deploying uh, Chef, uh, deploying OpenStack with Chef. Cool. Cool. Jesse? So uh, my name is Jesse Andrews. I'm with Nebula. And um, the reason I'm on the stage, I guess, is that I started a project called DevStack, which um, basically it doesn't use either of these things. And uh, <laughs> although you can use both Puppet and Chef to deploy DevStack, the problem it tries to solve is there are hundreds, I think 180 or something contributed in the last six months or something like that, um, of people doing development on OpenStack. And what we want to do is on every single commit, uh, run a, as much of a test as we can get before we, uh, uh, does everything still work together, all the different projects. Um, so not just unit tests, integration tests. Um, does it actually work together before we actually do the merge? And so we had originally started working on, you know, do you doing the packaging and then after you get it packaged using 
we actually had both Puppet and Chef recipes, but what we ran into was the problem that when any of those steps broke because developers made changes in, in, in you know, how things need to be installed, um, they would yeah. run away and not actually help us because they don't, they aren't experts at Debian packaging or RPM packaging or Chef or Puppet, and so not every developer knew every single tool. And so we're like, what does everybody hate? So it's half the people hate Chef, half the people hate Puppet. I don't know if they hate, but anyway, everybody hates Bash, so we use Bash. Um, um, so it's a Bash script that's a thousand or so lines of code now, and you could just set some options and it will download everything and install it. Um, the, the goal, though, is that it helps like Matt on his job by a developer saying that we changed something and you need to be aware of it. And so hopefully uh, package maintainers and recipe people building products and recipes on top of it can look at what we're doing uh, and then actually update their recipes or packages based on it. Yeah. I mean, if uh, probably the people here have already been to devstack.org, it's, it's great. It has comments for all the, what it's doing. It's a you know, well-documented bash script. We've actually been looking at, at using the same software that you use, and, and, and I forget what it's called for um, comments for inline documentation for Puppet modules. Yeah, there's, there's it, we use something, the idea is Shoko or Doko or Roko. There's different, there's one Roko. for each language, but yeah, it's pretty nice. Literate programming for Bash. So, so one thing that I, I forgot to mention is I lead up the development efforts and the community efforts around Puppet Labs and, and the Puppet modules for OpenStack. Probably important. <laughs> Or relevant. <laughs> Wait, really? You can use Puppet to install OpenStack? Yes, you can absolutely <laughs> use Puppet to install OpenStack. Wow, that's that's fantastic. Okay. Yeah, how's that working? It works. It's it's reliable. Yeah. Um, repeatable, and yeah, a lot of people are are, are definitely using it and, and contributing to it. There's Excellent. there's no question it could be better. <laughs> Wait, no question it could be what? Better. Oh, and how? So I would like for it to live a little bit closer to the development process. Yeah. Um, I think, and that's a, a lot of what I'm doing here and, and asking people about is, is kind of where does it make sense for it to live in the actual development ecosystem? Um, yeah. Which I think is, is, is one of the big questions. Do, do you want it closer to dev stack or do you, or, or do you pr pr prefer, sorry, I'm taking no. over moderator. No, go for it. Or no. do you prefer to work with releases? So that's a really interesting question. I, I, I had assumed for the longest time that it was something that consumed packages, but I think there's a lot of value in having configuration tools that can not only do deployments based on packages, but also be used for development. Uh, but I think it's gonna be a, a, a progression to get from where we are now, which is kind of something chasing releases to, to getting from there to chasing trunk, and then from getting there to gating, or, or sorry, post-gating, and then the big question will be, you know, once we're at the, at the post-gating step, you know, how much sense does it make for it to also be gating? Yeah, which is an interesting question when, as Jesse said, if you've got Chef and Puppet and DevStack and Juju and CF Engine, anybody here from CF Engine? No? Okay, weird. Um, but yeah, how do you, how do you, do you, how do your developers deal with that? As a well, I think that that's where um, identifying the minimal core that happens as you're going in, um, and that's like I think like I think you actually help set up DevStack with the CI gating project. Yeah. But as 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 OpenStack continues to grow, there's so many options for you know what backend do you use, how, what storage, even how do you want your storage and backend to be related? And like I think Nova has 600 flags. Yeah. And so um, <clears throat> having it such that uh, we could chain uh, like. Our, the gating, so like once something lands in trunk, then it could go ahead and deploy with your, your recipes that, that currently exist and build packages as they currently exist. So at least you know if there's regressions occurring. Um, and then you could go in and fix them. Right, so uh, within Chef for OpenStack, there are many parallel forks and uh, several of them have CI already applied to them. And my goal is eventually to take kind of the main trunk and offer it up to fit it into the other CI branches, because you know <clears throat> we are working. There are there are forks that are working with source already instead of just packages, because yeah. you know some providers need a certain feature that is you know not stable yet or not released yet. But uh, you know, let's get in there. So it's actually you you you've both touched on something that I've we, I've actually been having some conversations with people about, and it's interesting that you you brought it up the the installing from source thing because it, it seems like I know when we started off. Uh, OpenStack originally, we spent a lot of effort to make sure that we had sort of packaging 
thoughts going on. And it seems like over time, oddly enough, as the project gets more mature, we are doing less and less with that, and we see more and more people going from a source. I'm, I'm sort of curious where you guys are seeing that go. I see that um, it's actually a good thing because what, we're, what was happening originally is we had developers going in and doing a crappy job of packaging. Yep. And so what we're having now is the actual distros and, and people who know about building RPMs and DEBs and, and chef recipes and all this go in and, and first of all, package it correctly, Aww. and then secondly, um, send, sending back requirements and here's things you could do to make it easier to actually implement. So, so one of the questions that I kind of have for, for the OpenStack community yeah. is, you know, OpenStack isn't really in the business of packaging right now and everything's running continuous integration from, from source. You know, does it make sense to actually have package deployment be part of the gating process? And, and when I think about should we be using packages versus so source for the Puppet modules, that's kind of my reverse of the question is, you know, should packages be part of the of the continuous integration process? Interesting, interesting question. Do you want to jump on that? Because I mean, uh, there's some the hard there, thing. That, there's history, definitely. <laughs> there's at one time um, a lot of different people working on lots of different packages, and nobody knew what to do. It's uh, certainly, I think, hard from the user community, the fact that we don't really have official packages that we recommend. We have tarballs, basically. Um, then again, the recommended way that is to go get, you know, like, whatever your favorite distros is version, or, you know, crowbar, or what have you. Um, so, you know, would it be better for us to, you know, have official packages, or should we be having it such that we have a really easy way for all these different people who are building both open and closed source editions to show, chain their Jenkinses together and then run the, you know, they run the packaging and then they run the, the that uh, testing afterwards and tell us when, when it's breaking. Because some of those configuration options require hardware that we don't necessarily even, I, Exactly. Would you yeah. like to really set that up? <laughs> no, in fact, I'm, I'm in fact not going to. Like, okay. it's just not going to. Uh, you, I, somebody asked me earlier if they could mail me some hardware, and I was like, sure, I'll put it in my living room. I don't know. Like, I, we don't have a data center. Um, so, yeah, that's not going to. But you're exactly right. Getting that, I'm, um, we've had that, and this is the, sort of the reason I asked the question about the, the, the source thing, is we've, we've been having a lot, when we stopped doing packaging in the, in the, project, um, it, was, it, was a, it was a big question mark, but a part of that did come from the distros saying, hey, we'd like to, we can do a better job of this than, than you're doing. <clears throat> have, you know? have the distros been engaged uh, to, to be like part of the gating F for CI, like, you know, <laughs> or, you know. This isn't supposed to be the, the, so the panel discussion on me now, <laughs> dude. But um, I mean, it always but, becomes a discussion you know, on you. If, if right now we're spitting out tarballs. Uh, anybody, anybody, great, no, uh, no, actually. Yeah. Um, we've asked for that several times, uh, for that to be more, to be, to do more of what Jesse's talking about. And for, for some legitimate reasons, they're concerned about being too noisy, um, and I hear that, and that's fine, but um, uh, it, it um, the distros have been fantastic at doing a lot of actual work inside of OpenStack, and I've been thrilled to have every single person from SUSE and Red Hat and Canonical that have, that have been in there doing Debian, uh, even though there's not a company behind that, but like the folks that are doing work have been doing great work. But I, I think that they're, the problem is, is they've all got processes that are centered around their release right. of their thing. And so we can, whereas we can talk, it would be the same thing as um, uh, you know, Dell or HP or Rackspace, they've got their clouds they're deploying and they've got developers working on the core software but the releases of those things aren't necessarily in lockstep. And so I think we've got that same sort of impedance mismatch. Um, but a, a lot of the developers probably, at least in the companies or, or projects that do have a lot of development resources, as you said, um, probably actually, if, if there was, would benefit from that sort of integration. Definitely. So yeah. um, I'm wondering, like again, this is maybe a sidetrack from what <laughs> this, well, this entire thing may have been a sidetrack so far. That's but, fine, yeah. um, I think that, uh, that there's, both from a performance testing, you know, the Tempest project, and so yeah. on and so forth, uh, getting that sort of gating up there, and maybe just having a few sample, you know, like test test stacks or something that Possibly. that are really like, here's what you do: get the script or Chef recipe or Puppet recipe, and it deploys Jenkins that chains to us, and then just uses the official Ubuntu and the official Red Hat, whoever, just yeah. do two or three of them, and then say, hey, community, take over. 
Well, I guess I guess sort of my in, incendiary the, the the way I was trying to make this be a little bit more incendiary is is if you're already working on a puppet module that uses things from source, do do injecting packages back into the mix does that help, or are you doing just fine pulling it directly from the Git repo? So I could I mean I have a pretty clear vision of of what puppet modules of of how to make the puppet modules configurable. For, for either doing source versus package installation. Yep. I mean, you can, you know, the way that actually compile and parsing is, is staged in Puppet, you could collect, you know, you could tag all the services and packages as being OpenStack and then collect and disable those from another scope. Yep. So you could use that to just kind of toggle a global switch to go from package and service to, you know, some special source versus service. But I think from my, from my perspective, um, the question is, you know, is that is that worth spending time on? Is that you know how do I prioritize that? Is that one of the more important things I could be working? Yeah, which I think which I think is the what sort of question I've I've been thinking about recently too is like should we, how much is this actually? Where's the, is it is it the thing we is it helpful? Might be. I'm just saying it is it I, worth I think thinking about. It would be valuable from the like I don't know of developers who willingly want to break, you know, other people's packaging and things like that and, totally. and tests. So. Um, adding longer and longerness to the gate, or adding complexity to gating to have those tests kicked off. Yeah. Uh, like if, if we all of a sudden have the matrix of like 80 different configurations that we God. actually test, <laughs> um, <laughs> such as MySQL had, uh, yeah. do we, we may not want to gate on that, but we, I think we'd want to know when, when regressions yeah. are occurring. So. And that's, totally. that's something that I'm thinking about, and I've, I've, talk, I've spoken with Dan Prince about maybe looking at, at using Smokestack and having that be master that goes along with Grizzly and, and do post-gating, like, like Smokestack is doing post-gating. But I think yeah. not really being an active developer, um, yeah, what do you guys think about Smokestack? Are you, are you guys pretty content with, with the post-gating model? I guess and they all look at me. Off, <laughs> maybe, well, I guess both of you guys are involved in the development process. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say everybody agrees one way or another, um, but uh, I, I, I think people are pretty happy with the gating that we have right now, unless their feature isn't in the that gating test. <laughs> yeah, um, which uh, and 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 we there have been just to follow up on that. We, there have been some decent discussions this week, and I think this is pulling back around to what you're talking about with with checking out the puppet or the or the chef um, things is 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 ways that we can we can hook in other people's testing work. I think is is how we start to expand that because yeah. everybody has their pet feature. Um, and so, how about you test? You hook up a thing, and then, yeah. then you don't have to convince me, you know, because that's, I mean, it involves beer again, but um, that's there's only so much beer I can consume in a given week. Um, yep. So, we possibly have beaten that one to death. Yep. Um, so uh, only three or four people left. What's that? Only I know. Three or four people yeah, left. I'm surprised that more of you are still here. Um, so uh, to go back into the, into, uh, that's a very good point. Yeah, there's internet in here. Um, so why, because <laughs> I'm pretty sure I know where they want this panel to go, why, why should I use uh, Chef rather than Puppet? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Chef versus Puppet, I've, I've, I've never been that. asked that. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> you know, well, I, I, I was gonna, I was gonna bring up a, a, an anecdote of a, a, an actual. Uh, there was a session with uh, uh, Mark Burgess from CF Engine and and uh, and uh, Adam Jacob from uh, Chef, where they traded each other slide decks and gave each other slide yeah. decks, and and you know that was. You know the nice things that I can say about Puppet. Yeah. You know, well, uh, actually, yeah. Why don't, why don't you said tell me why I should use Puppet? So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Puppet is uh, uh, in trouble. <laughs> yeah, uh, Puppet is uh, it's embedded in the new Cisco uh, OpenStack stuff. Yeah, it is. That's that's cool. Yeah. Um, what's that? And Red Hat stuff. Too. And Red Hat stuff. So uh, yeah, I, I mean, do. <laughs> yeah, got the Puppet guy giving me leads. Um, <laughs> You know, um, you know, Dan has been involved in uh, OpenStack since uh, I saw you at Austin, I guess, or Bear. Yeah, I guess I started sneaking around Austin. About <laughs> yeah, so I mean, about a year ago. We've both been at you know the last six summits. Um, you know, and uh, we've had you know. six of these things. Wow. Yeah. And so you know, both projects have been involved for a long time, and so uh, you know, 
you are going to get uh, access to people who you know know the rough spots, have been, uh, have seen a lot of deployments already, and you know hopefully have uh, got stuff that works and is reproducible, and other people are are use finding useful. So, you know, <coughs> uh, both tools have have their place. Well, so that you, that leads to a to a, a bit there. Um, you said you, you get access to the people that have that have worked on these things before, and you get access to their knowledge. Um, to to speak for our, our absent uh, Juju, I know that one of their one of the things that they they put out as a as a feature is sort of the reusable nuggets of you know apt get install WordPress server, right? The the equivalent of that. Um, what's the I? But that reusability seems to be something I've heard from both both camps, both you guys' camps from from day one. Like, what's the? Is there is there a you guys working on that same thing? You got reusable, like is it, how is, so how is me getting your knowledge through your system working out? So I think just in, in terms of you know, general knowledge, and, and of course one of the reasons that, that Puppet and, and Puppet Labs is so interested in, in OpenStack is that the easier that we can make it to get to those self-service APIs, the more interesting kinds of automation things we can do on top of, of those APIs. And, and just talking about reusable content going beyond OpenStack, uh, forge.puppetlabs.com um, is, is a great place to go. I think we have around 600 contributions, um, a, a lot from the community. And, and we, we have a lot of content, but one of the challenges now that we have with the Forge is trying to filter that and, and make it easier for people to not just find lots of content, but to find the content that they need to, to deploy their applications. Right. And great. so, you know, Going back to the idea of reusable content yeah. um, and you know embedded kind of wisdom of that content, you know one of the re one of the things that we have going with uh, the the chef cookbooks is you know these are used by real deployments at, at scale. You know this is uh, uh, it's it's parallel to the work being done by Rackspace. Uh, it's used at DreamHost. It's used at AT and T. Um, you know HP. Uh, a lot of the work you know that I did with HP early on. You know has filtered back in, and uh, I said Dell, right? You know, uh, Dell's involved. Um, you know, uh, the session we had yesterday, we had six or seven companies where people were like, I'll do that, I'll do that, you know? And so we are watching each other's forks and branches, and then, you know, I'm just kind of a, a ringleader in the middle, making sure that if I come into this community, I'm actually getting something of value. You know, if I, if I go to, you know, uh, let's say I go to DreamHost, for example, they're not really incented to make your OpenStack deployment work. You know, I mean, they're busy running a public cloud. You know, and, and so what you know what you get by having you know lots of people working on the same code and someone trying to make it useful in the middle is, you know, someone that is actually incented to, to help you succeed. So uh, that's that's what you get with you know the Chef or OpenStack side of things. Cool. And I think it's it's similar. I, I I've recently called myself kind of the the hub and, and the wheel with all the sporks of uh, uh, sporks. Sporks. All sporks. <laughs> you should see my nice. car, my, my bicycle. I am from Portland. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> the old yeah. Hub and spork. <laughs> yeah. You guys, you guys just eat nothing with nothing but sporks up there. No, actually, I have a bicycle that's just a hub with oh all the sporks. Of course you do. <laughs> it's amazing. It's actually a unicycle. Yeah. So I'm, I'm I'm sad there wasn't more of a Seattle Portland thing because now it's going to be you and me and that's not nearly as fun. But I was saying, a lot of what I do is, is really, you know, all these companies that are deploying OpenStack have the best practices and the knowledge, and it's all about working with them and, and being the person that leads, making sure that, that those changes go upstream so that everyone can take advantage of them. So I want to do a follow-up on that. Sure. Um, so one of the challenges in DevStack is the fact that everybody has different requirements, and people want to do Ceph backends or Fedora or Ubuntu, or how well do, does your various recipes and, and cookbooks do at providing flexibility for like all sorts of scenarios or um, at what point do you have to say like here's my cookbooks for this scenario and here's my cookbooks for this scenario or recipes? If I can go first. Um, I, I, I think a, a couple things there. Um, one is that most of the differences between platforms are really data differences. It's, it's almost a, an internationalization problem of Everything's the same, only the names have changed. Well, uh, how about things like Zen Server versus KVM and things like that? So right now, um, you know, Libvirt is is the thing that, that's mainly supported. Uh, but an, a great thing about the community is there's someone from Microsoft working on Hyper-V support. Um, Zen support 
existed originally uh, because the Puppet stuff was done for the for Rackspace Cloud, uh, but they've definitely forked off, and I'm not sure how supported the Zen stuff is. But I think in a lot of ways, that's, that's due to demand. You know, the people that are using the stuff will add the extensions that they need. And so it wouldn't be that complex if, if the people put in the time to upstream those and you'd have one recipe that would support Zen and Hyper-V and uh, KVM, or is everything's, that? Everything's been designed with, to have directory layouts where it's obvious if you want to add an extension where that extension goes. And it's also been designed, so there's really kind of three layers. Um, it's, it's kind of three layers of code where at the very back end you have very specific classes and very specific configuration interfaces. So you might want to do something like this is a, a glance file backend or a glance Swift backend. And it's maybe there's a hundred of those that are composed into kind of the roles that you may want to deploy, things like a, a glance, which is a registry and an API, or, or a keystone, or a database, which is a database with the six um, databases, or sorry, a MySQL server with the six databases that have to be added. And then at the very top level, there's something called controller and something called compute. And the interesting thing is I designed it like that, thinking that people with different amounts of complexity, you know, people for getting started would say, I want a controller, I want a compute, but that really most, most big companies would wind up customizing using all the little bits. And what I've found is that's actually not true, that, that people are actually fairly happy to say, if you can either give me a controller and a compute, or if you can just give me the, the seven or, or whatever roles I want, that's actually what people prefer. Is, is that as the interface, and then hide all the details okay. of the implementation behind it. And so, uh, Chef? Yeah, so uh, the, way, the way Chef for OpenStack is organized is, uh, is around roles. And so, uh, you know, currently the, the N plus one model of, you know, N, N computes and, and one controller is, is definitely there. The, all the services uh, could be decomposed to run on separate machines. So, uh, you know, if MySQL is clustered over here, Rabbits clustered over there, and then you know, computes are each on, on different boxes. So that's the approach we've taken: is you know, uh, the roles are all separable. So as people need to, you know, replace an individual component, you know, maybe Rabbit isn't what they want; they want something else. You know, we'll put in a different. Uh, you know, we'll use that role to search against to you know, just plug in whatever the the messenger is. So then as far as like, again, the, I think Zen Server versus sure. KVM is the largest difference just because in Zen Server, the recommended way to deploy is using a DOMU to run most of the things, whereas KVM, we're running directly on the host. Right. Do, do, does the, like I know that the uh, crowbar uses it in a certain way, so that's KVM if, I don't, if I'm not mistaken, but um, do, is there a good Zen Server and um, other support? There is, uh, over in the Smokestack cookbooks, they've got uh, Zen Server. Um, no one has really asked for Zen specifically. Uh, you know, what uh, what kind of happens with the cookbooks is you know, it, it, if somebody wants a feature and you know we talk about hey, how are we going to get that supported? So uh, right now we have you know KVM and LXC and you know talking about Hyper V, they all follow the same model where it's you know you fork off an attribute and it says you know I'm using compute, compute uh, needs to include a recipe. Oh, what is my hypervisor? It's KVM. Include these. You know, if it's uh, Hyper-V, include this. So, if Dan or whoever is working on Smosac put the time in to upstream that change, and others or others were interested, that's something that would fit in. Again. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. The the model we we've uh, you know I've espoused is if there's a feature you want to support, where you know we will make if it's not already pluggable, we'll make it pluggable. And how much is that magic yeah. where you have to be experts at your various tools to be able to have that degree of flexibility, or is that pretty low? Um, it, it, it's fairly standard. Like if you're a Chef user already, it's not hard to, to okay. see this pattern where it's like you set an attribute here in the role, and magically I'm well, using LXC. How about building the recipes themselves? Uh, yeah, so the recipes. Are the uh, recipes magical, or are they pretty? <laughs> That's right. actually not that much magic, <laughs> you know, because uh, a Chef does a pretty good job of uh, making reusable components, and so, you know, uh, I think Chef for OpenStack uses twenty some community cookbooks that, you know, we didn't have to go and like rewrite whatever feature; it's just grabbed it out of community and and started using it, and so we're you know the the OpenStack cookbooks are getting committed back to the community. And we're trying to just keep, you know, I, I try to get whatever comes in, we commit it back to the community, document it. And so, 
when somebody says, well, I want to run LXC, but I want a Ceph backend, and I want to use Postgres, we're like, set this attribute, this attribute, and this attribute, and you're good to go. So you've both uh, mentioned uh, people that are, that are using um, the modules and, and cookbooks and stuff like that, and then question marks about getting, getting some of their work upstreamed. Are there, are there barriers to, uh, to, to getting that stuff in, um, or, or question like, what's, how are you seeing that, that going? I can say that, that it seems like, like time is really the number one barrier. So, uh, everyone's really racing for to have something every six months. And yeah. I, think, I think part of it is time, but I think also part of it is, is, is culture for, for companies to understand open source. And, and definitely a lot of the companies that are joining OpenStack are not traditionally open source companies. It's very true. And I think it'll just take some time for people to really understand the benefits so they can justify to spend the time to get things upstream. Yeah. So if the release was, let's say, every two months, would that be better or worse? Worse. <laughs> what if it was every day? Are you providing packages? <laughs> Do you want me to provide packages? So are you going to go double A in, in just a I'm few just, days? I was, I was sort of mildly leading towards if, like, off of that every two months is a lot of the companies that are doing this are looking at more of a continual deployment model rather than a I'm going to go grab the latest release. Not that the Shuttleworth demo wasn't fantastic because it was actually really cool, but like, Doing an apt get upgrade from from one release to the next release, I'm guessing, is not how most public clouds are running themselves, at least. I, or maybe you're wrong. You you guys are seeing more than am I. I only work for one company, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm guessing that's not how uh, it's working. I, what I have seen and heard is is usually that uh, no, no, people are not apt get upgrading. They're you know decommissioning racks and switching them. Right. You know, slowly migrating things over. Right. So. so that being said, the, so there's, there's sort of a two-pronged thing here. One is the, is the question of what if we weren't releasing every six months and or what if we were releasing more continually? Would that help or hurt? And the other one is, is how's, how's upgradability rolling upgrades and stuff like that working out for you? So I think one thing that, that's important from my perspective is if, if OpenStack was going to release every day, then for sure you're going to have, I mean, the APIs have version one, version two, and I think you need to make the same kind of commitment for the command line interfaces and also for the configuration interfaces. You know, that they need to support some kind of semantic versioning so you can have expectations about when things may break. That Good would point. be nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, uh, that's, that's partially what, um, you know, maybe we could get into with, uh, I, I know Vish did some work for XML interfaces to, from the public side, now that we're doing, anytime a, commit is made, we actually make sure that the XML is still generated the same way because none of the tools out of the box, like all the, all the CLI tools, all the libraries actually just use JSON. So it was just lucky if XML was working or not. Whereas now we're actually testing that. Um, so whether we get there soon or late, um, I think we're, we're adding more um, tools in place because of the fact that there are a lot public clouds actually yeah. doing continuous deployment with OpenStack. Um, and there are uh, individual companies I know that are doing uh, continuous deployment on their own <laughs> products, even though there's then a, a barrier between when they are done internally versus shipping. Mm -hmm. But um, could, do you guys, can you think of certain priorities that you would add there? Like, um, um, like if you had three things to ask for as far as helping with the upgradability, is the CLI's interfaces at the top or? JSON, I mean, print JSON. And, and, and I heard that's a feature that's coming in Grizzly, that there'll be an option for, all, for everything flags, so that as opposed to tables, you can just dump JSON. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, stability and configuration would be amazing. Um, yeah. You know, the, the CLI, we don't use a lot of mm -hmm. in, in actual configuration and deployment, but it's just, you know, Things are mostly in the same places, but the config files seem to be moving around. A Maybe we're, this is then a chicken and egg in the sense that uh, um, by having sort of the post commits where we're deploying yeah. with the recipes maybe, and then running Tempest against them, uh, which I think is very similar to what you know, the public yeah. clouds are, are doing. Um, maybe if we have that resources for the community, we could capture those. But I don't know if, it, like, you, you guys are not having your own CI infrastructure for these projects, correct? Or I have some, I mean, I mean, right now I'm, I'm running unit tests, but not integration tests. That's something I'm hoping I'm getting soon. Uh, but just like Matt said with his project, there are people who have built products on top of this stuff who are running continuous integration on, on their, their distributions of it. Yeah. 
and uh, <clears throat> I'm working with one of those uh, people who are, you know, packaging up Chef for OpenStack, and we will open source, you know, a CI tool chain to do it yourself, you know. Excellent. So just as a, as a general note, because we can, we can do this for a while, honestly, it turns out, we, we all like to talk. Um, but uh, there's, there is a microphone in the, middle of the, in the middle of the room, so if at any point anybody takes offense to anything that we've said or, or wants to ask a question or whatever, feel free to, to sort of jump in. Or just wants to jump up and oh, shout. But, oh, wow, that, that, that was quick. <laughs> you know, there are a couple really more sessions starting right now, so I What's thought that? it would be a good idea to ask it. Guys, do you have uh, recipes for deploying highly available OpenStack? In particular, let me rephrase it. Can a regular ops guy take your chef or puppet recipes and deploy full production environment with uh, DRBD or Peacemaker or something on top of it? Uh, not yet. Okay. Um, we're, we're, you know, I mean, uh, there are some production environments, you know, of, of Chef for OpenStack that are uh, being configured that way, and uh, I expect before Grizzly, um, that should be a, an available configuration. You know, now that there is a, you know, semi-official uh, HA support for, for uh, Folsom, uh, we'll, we'll be implementing it. And I, I would say that um, we have a repository which shows an example of how you can wrap an HA layer on top of, of, of what I've created and actually all the components have an enabled flag which can work for active passive even though I kind of had implemented the capability to allow active passive modes for everything um, as iteration one because really what I want is active active. And I'm actually working with members of the community who have a fork that supports um, active active for all the components that I'm, I'm currently in the process of merging in. What do you find the most complex to make highly available um, from the queuing or database or like what, what, what is the challenge from having the recipes just work in HA mode out of, the, out of the gate or is it different environments require different things? I know that, that, that for the HA mode that I'm working with a partner on that it was um, that they actually needed to change some of the configuration um, options to allow multiple rabbit hosts, for example. Um, but I know that that stuff's actually going into Grizzly. So that'll be, that'll be one of the challenges. When you say active passive, are you doing just like uh, HA pairs of, of the services? That's what I had done. I I'd implemented um, a, a, a prototype basically using Pacemaker and, and, and yeah, and exactly. Yeah. Uh, but going forward, the, the thing that I'm really looking at is using um, Galera, and, and it's really a, a partner has been working on a lot more than I have, so I know, I know that I am, am looking at the code as it comes in and merging it. Yeah, yeah so the uh, Florian, Haas, Florian, is Florian yeah, here? gave I an HA talk, yeah. uh, and, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's Pacemaker for the various Nova services, Galera for MySQL, uh, RabbitMQ's clustering, so uh, trying to move away from pairing, and I think tomorrow, CloudStack, has an HA talk to? Yes. Yes. So. Uh, well, right, right. Um, I'm just, you know, just giving a shout out for more HA. Yeah, <coughs> HA's good. <laughs> oh, I've done that again. Oh, it got darker. I thought my monitor was dimming again. Um, so I, the the we've touched on it a couple. Of, I think Jesse and I've actually both mildly asked the question, but I don't know, went somewhere else. Uh, about uh, about upgrading and and that sort of that sort of path upgrading yeah <laughs> <laughs> I could, I, let me preface this bit that us in OpenStack developers haven't uh, up until maybe a few months ago hadn't really put much effort into really providing like what we are doing in DevStack was trying to do proto packaging and proto recipes we hadn't been doing the work to show how to move between the, uh, upgrades in, in so, fact Jesse. Do you have a project somewhere yes, to DevStack that is that no. is some that, um, that has something so, to do with upgrades? So, you know, we're looking forward to how we can do that. And, and actually, Vish and uh, Dean, who work on DevStack, worked on a project called Grenade. That the idea was that it would deploy the old one and then try to run a set of scripts and then deploy the new one and then make sure the instances and volumes and all that are still there. Now, um, we caught some bugs and and it, but it. It helped with catching bugs of how upgrades need to occur and making sure that the migrations actually work. But it, I don't think it was in time to help 
you guys with actually knowing how you move from one, re one release to another. So I think that you guys are currently are facing two problems, of which is you have to chase developers and try to figure out what actually changed, and then actually get the recipes to work. Yeah, so uh, on the Chef for OpenStack mailing list, we had a thread about uh, what are we going to do about upgrades? And it kind of got turfed because it seems like all along no one has given enough thought to upgrades and, and said, so the next it became, we'll do it with Folsom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so it, it, it is kind of an ongoing problem because what really happens is you stand up, you know, Diablo or Cactus. I mean, uh, in the Mercado Libre talk, you know, they stood up Cactus and then over here they stood up Essex, you know, because there was no upgrade path. And so until you know, we are, we are followers. You know, we are going to be consuming what is available. So if, if there is a, you know, a grizzly upgrade guide that says, you know, this changes to this and this changes to this, we can recreate it. I mean, we can, we can you know, we can, you know, programmatically you do. have the technology. Yeah, we, we, we're good at scripting. Yeah, if, there's, <laughs> if there's a document that says how to do it with, with some assurance that it will work and not blow everything up, yeah. Yeah. then for sure we can automate it. What if that document is a shell script? Fine. I read Bash. Great. Yeah, I can read Bash. I would. It'd be interesting to see if, if that if Puppet should model a shell script versus if Puppet should get. It depends on what the shell script looks like. Well, and the, the shell script is again just meant to be a proto. Like re, it's the, the dev stack and Grenade. The, the goal is that you guys are actually the audience and, and deployers, not not. You know, it's not actually meant to be used as deployment. And Wait, so, Jesse, are you saying that people shouldn't use dev stack for production deployments? Um, Burn. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> they shouldn't. If you, uh, if you know what you're doing. By, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so it should on people on purpose, write. it destroys everything every time you run it. But yeah. would you recommend that people who write tools for production employment should read DevStack and check diffs on DevStack to understand what to the do? The hope is yes. And so if it sucks, I would like to know. <laughs> We've got a question out here. So, so does Grenade only test the default DevStack changes, or does it test? Test all the config options that it, DevStack doesn't it, use. It doesn't. I mean, so that this was just the first stab at it, and so the question is: is first of all, is it the right uh, even tool? Because you know we are, of course, just taking DevStack and then uh, installing the, the previous version, then running a set of configuration changes, and then running the new version. Um, but it did enough where we could check like send a Nova volumes to Cinder, and you know, the idea is maybe we could help with the Nova uh, network to Quantum. Um, so, so the big changes. Right. Yeah, and, and, but again, this was just like a month or two of work at, right at the end because we realized while well, during Folsom, a lot of people said that, hey, let's work on upgrades. A lot of work did happen behind the scenes like with a versioned RPC and other, other things in the code to help that uh, so that you could actually do live upgrades. Um, there wasn't necessarily that much communication between the people doing the development and the people who actually are asked, how do I do this? <laughs> And I guess I, I can say too that you know that's definitely one of the one of the advantages of, of Puppet and, and these configuration management tools is that they can really check to see what the current state of the system is and, and manage state transitions. But the bigger question is, is there actually a set of state transitions that can do a live upgrade? Yeah. And and I think for certain use cases you could get really close to a live upgrade, maybe with control uh, control plane downtime, um, but not necessarily. I, so data, so your VMs will continue to operate, um, and you, you know everything. Will, but we recommend currently turning off your control plane while you actually do these operations. Um, moving forward, we're actually adding versioned API, uh, versioned RPCs, which are how all the in, uh, components actually communicate, which will allow you to then upgrade each individual things as a rolling basis, like upgrade some of the workers, make sure it still works, and then continue on. We have the added challenge, though, of the fact that we have you know, the HPs and rack spaces who are doing continuous deployment who can you know, like do those baby steps to do larger changes. And they, they could support the version today and the version tomorrow and, and not have to do that gradual change out if you're doing something large. But when we talk about six month increments of work, it becomes potentially much harder to do that sort of rolling upgrade in a single uh, deployment. And so that's, that's kind of why I was getting to um, you know, at what stage should we look at um, you know, more rapid releases, um, as well as, um, as, as like for instance, Nova is becoming calmer in the sense that we're removing features and it's becoming just about uh, VMs. 
uh, you know, if it becomes mostly about drivers, like improving the Hyper-V or Zen server, um, having more r rapid releases, but it's mostly drivers uh, and, and inter interactions with uh, other tools, um, is, it a, is it better to have more rapid releases? The, the rapid releases doesn't become a problem if APIs have all stabilized. You know, uh, I, I know the, the conversation comes up uh, every summit. Um, <laughs> you know, is OpenStack the APIs or is OpenStack the projects? You know, both. And, <laughs> both. <laughs> and, and if, if those it's APIs... The it's OpenStack the people. OpenStack is the people. It's the love. Um, <laughs> if, if those APIs aren't stable enough, you know, to switch out pieces, you know, or have them versioned, then, you know, we can't handle Well, I think that <laughs> in order to even do upgrades, you had to have them versioned, um, and, and, or at least the ability to have the old thing and the new thing running at the same time. And we have that problem, though, of the six-month release versus the every day or every hour or how often the continuous deployment guys do it. Yep. So it's an added challenge that you know, maybe the, the recipes that help with upgrades for the real releases don't actually help with the people who are doing continuous deployment. Because, um, they need to chase different goals, maybe. That's, that's where I was trying to get to, how much magic is there in these things that you have to be an expert to be able to talk to both. Um, like, imagine you were doing a rolling upgrade and you had, you know, you had a subset of your systems in Essex and Folsom. Would, you, would it be relatively easy to have packages and your recipes be able to support moving them with all the coordination between all the services? I can say, yeah, that it's it's possible you might have to write your own your own coordination layer, but we're we're working on on you know using the the resource model to manage coordination between things. Uh, but in terms of of you know a pretty typical workflow for for upgrades with Puppet would be using environments which allow you to have multiple versions of code, and then targeting in in no op, which means don't run, but tell me what would happen if I run against the new environment to determine change impact to make a decision if you want to do a live run. And then run live while using, for orchestration, uh, you could use mCollective, which is another Puppet Labs tool, which is essentially uh, a, a message bus that sits between the person controlling their environment and all the Puppet agents. So you can use that for staggered runs to say maybe, maybe run one, check it manually, and then say, well, let's run the next 30%. Let's run the next 30%. Yeah, and so that's um, and, and so that's the model that you're looking at in terms of how to deal with the the fact that you're you don't really want to just update the module, change the version, and have all thousand machines splat out an upgrade at the same time. Right, right. No, you would definitely want to ma maintain just like you were talking about maintaining multiple simultaneous API versions. It's it's very similar to to that concept. So. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you also use M Collective to manage your puppet agents? You, you can use M Collective, but uh, <laughs> I mean, we have environments as well. We have, you know, the idea of rolling upgrades, but, you know, switching between environments. That's that's how people do stuff for real. You know? Yeah. What? How's the? How's the? Because these things are getting pretty big. How's the the scaling uh, picture looking? For you? And this is honestly, I'm just curious. Like, as people are doing thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of nodes, is that? Is that within the capabilities of, of what you guys are doing and stuff? Um, I can't speak for the size of, of all the users. Uh, you know, um, you could ask Dreamhost. You know, they're very public about their deployment. Cool, cool. Uh, you could ask, you know, HP, who's not very public. Um, I, I don't know if I can ask HP. <laughs> that, that might be very difficult for me to do. Right, but I, I mean, know anybody uh, that works there. You know, definitely, um, you know, substantial production environments. Uh, that are being deployed uh, with Chef, um, yep. and you know, but I'll let those guys talk. I, I've got four boxes. So. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's that's so many more boxes than I have. <laughs> and, and I can say the same for for Puppet. Um, you know, there's so many different ways to run Puppet to achieve different kinds of performance. Um, of course, Puppet Apply just running, you know, synchronizing just code and then running everything locally is going to scale, you know, forever. The the Puppet Master itself, if you're running in client server mode. Is is by default stateless, except for CSRs, which whatever. Uh, but it, but it's basically stateless. So they can be scaled horizontally. Uh, but there are definitely a lot of feature add-ons. If you're taking advantage of all the features, like maintaining a configuration management database and and really using the entire feature set of the Puppet server, then it, it definitely, as you add state, it does have limits on scaling. Yeah, fair. Um, 
Any other questions up there? That's we're actually at the, the end of the list of questions that I've got. Any questions? Any any more questions from folks in the in the room? Or any other things that you guys would like to delve into? We got a thing. There's a thing. Do you guys maintain different branches for the different OpenStack versions? Uh, yes. Uh, we currently have uh, an Essex branch and a master branch, and the master is when Grizzly milestones start to come around, we'll turn master into Folsom, and and then you know and have master will be Grizzly, I guess. Uh, and then there's lots of community forks. So you know I, you know somebody like uh, Dreamhost has, you know they've got their Folsom branch, but in their branch they have things like you know sources. They're pulling source for Quantum, I guess, because there's right. stuff they wanted, and, and so. Uh, you know, there's lots of forks and, and branches. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm also using, um, I have a fork or a, a branch for, I don't even think I have a branch for Diablo. I think I just gave up. Um, I have one for Essex, for Folsom. Um, yeah. The state that things should be in next week is an Essex uh, branch, a Folsom branch, and then Master is going to yeah. be for, for Grizzly. Um, and I had spent some time briefly last week thinking about trying to simultaneously support all versions and pretty quickly decided against it just because I, I asked the same question in the in the uh, in the chef you know cookbooks session yesterday like who wants to keep working on Essex and it was kind of like <laughs> crickets yeah <laughs> yeah I mean people are ready to move to Folsom well for me it was more just like it's it becomes accumulation of technical debt to, to try to maintain a single branch for this stuff it's tagged yeah <laughs> cool anything else from anybody out there I think, yeah. I was going to say, I think oh, we've made There's a hand back there. Oh. Oh. Or he's waving goodbye. Is there any one feature in Chef or Puppet that you feel is not in the other tools that you think is like a, a killer feature? <laughs> I mean, both both products are uh, pushed by each other. And, and so, you know, they had a no-op mode. And so we have a, a Y run mode. And, you know, and then one of their devs is like, now we have to make our no-op mode, you know, have the same features that Y run has. And, you know, so... Uh, we have had search. You guys now have search. Yeah, we do have search. Um, you know, it's uh, good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so, uh, you know, we we use Ruby. They have a Ruby DSL. Um, we did that one first, though. <laughs> uh, well, you existed first. <laughs> but I mean, you know, uh, Chef was was written uh, kind of in a response to things that you know. Why philosophical differences about uh, how Puppet worked. And over the years, those differences have kind of simmered down a little bit. And so both projects you know, are doing a lot of the same things. Um, it, it really comes down to you know, what, what, what matches your engineers' minds. You know, uh, you know, what are you thinking about you know, architecting a, a big system, or are you thinking about it as individual servers? I'm I'm curious. Out of those two, like which would you say is is, is related to those two? So on on your website, does it talk about uh, system systems uh, managing individual systems? Because on ours, we're talking about continuous delivery. We're talking about you know your business moving everything from code to production. You know, I mean, we're that's that's where we're pushing people. I guess there there's no question that that's a lot of of what we're working on with our customers. Um, in terms of, of branding stuff on the website for direction, um, I, I, I can't really speak enti very intelligently <laughs> about it. Um, nobody, I, nobody can. It turns out it's marketing. It's not it's marketing. Intelligent. But I would say that that you know I think Matt really hit on on one of the major differences is is do you want a, a, a Ruby API or a Ruby based DSL or do you want a declarative syntax which is um, a little bit simpler but but. Simpler, which has which has pros and cons for, for different use cases, and I think the other thing in, in in Puppet is, you know, the entire reason that you take Puppet code and and kind of compile it is it all compiles down to a data structure, and I think that's really one of the one of the differences of Puppet is that everything in in Puppet is data and everything's exchanged as a as a well known data format, which is actually a directed acyclical graph. Right, and and Chef is is built on the idea of your infrastructure is a code base. You know, and, and so that's, you know, at the end of the day, you have a DSL, you have a, a you know, a Ruby, you know, yeah. a programming is, language. Is it, is it data or is it code? Yeah. Data. 
<laughs> that was your you cue. Pull up. Okay, cool. <laughs> Dying here. Cool. Any, anybody else? All right. Cool. I think that's about it. Great. Thanks, guys.